Thank you very much, Mr. Curtis Dickinson. And, et maintenant, nous passons donc au panel numéro 4. And this brings us to panel session number four with respect to the uh, topic uh, whether uh, the European regulation from solvency to, to GDPR is a model for the world or a barrier to competition. I would like to ask uh, Florence Tondu Melik, uh, Jean Francois Lecroix. Uh, Marie Law Denis and Jacques de Peretti, as well as Gabriel Bernardino, to come to the front. Good afternoon, everyone. This is the uh, fourth and last panel session for the day, uh, which uh, is entitled as such is a European regulation a model for the rest of the world or barrier to competition now let us uh, try and address this question this afternoon but also to engage in some kind of a forward looking uh, um, reflection to look at how this regulation could be changed in order to adjust to new challengers that the insurance industry is confronted with, as well as any adjustments, any changes, which might uh, um, remedy any insufficiencies uh, coming out after the enforcement of these new regulations. Now, to do this, it is my pleasure to have on this panel Gabriel Bernardino, who is the chair of EIOPA, uh, the uh, European Authority of Insurance and Occupational Pensions. We have uh, uh, Marie-Laure Denis, who is the chair of CNIL, uh, the French uh, privacy agency. We have uh, Florence uh, tondu melik who is the director general, chairman and CEO of Zurich France, and Jacques de Peretti, who is the chairman and uh, uh, CEO of AXA France. So the panel discussion will be held in uh, French, uh, with Gabriel Bernardino having a perfect command of uh, French, but will be speaking in English. It's easier for me, says Gabriel. I would like to turn to you, Gabriel, mm, uh, in your capacity as a, a keen observer and a sharp practitioner of the European insurance industry and European regulations to have uh, your first insights on our title, Is European Regulation a Model? for the rest of the world or a barrier to competition? Is it a barrier to competition? Um, and uh, thanks again for the invitation to be in here. It's always a pleasure. I'm for sure the person that has been more times uh, in the FFA conference. Uh, so <laughs> on that, I can tick the box. Um, now, you would not be surprised if, of course, my answer is that uh, you know, it should be a model. And uh, it's not that. Uh, it's not that I think we are superior to the others. It's also, I think, we should be proud of what we do also in Europe. And, uh, and I think that there's, of course, areas where uh, I think we can give a lot to, to the world. There's areas where we need also to learn. I think that we are, of course, in a, in a, global, uh, in a global discussion and trying, uh, I would say, to do uh, the best we can, of course, in the circumstances that we have. Uh, I, I think that when we look at uh, regulation, it's always it's always a balance. Uh, there's no one truth in regulation, and especially in financial regulation, when you deal, of course, with so many different types of objectives. You know, we want to protect uh, people. We want, uh, as we've heard in here, of course, to have the role of investment in the society for the benefit of the society uh, at large. Uh, we have the stability, of course, also of the, the, the sector, the stability of the economy. So there's a lot of objectives. And, and regulation tries, of course, to strike an, an equilibrium and, of course, a, a balance in between all these objectives. And it will always be uh, you know, something that we will pursue. Now, what we need to do, and I think that in Europe, in that, in that area, I think we are we are particularly good, to be very honest, and we should be. Sometimes uh, I, I agree with uh, Pierre Gramegna when he said that we should sell better our product. I think we should also be proud of that. We are very good in doing regulation. Let's be very honest. You know, we have, we 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 take long periods. We we know how to deal with these uh, 28 uh, member states with uh, many many stakeholders. And I think we are progressively also uh, entering into a phase where 
we are capable of looking at the implementation and to be critical about that also, which for me it's also part of the good regulatory process because there's no regulation in the world that is perfect. Let's be very honest because regulation very often is, you know, it's, it's constructed looking at what you learn from the past you try to give separate types of incentives, but then things change, the reality change. So that's why, of course, for example, in Solvency 2, we had already envisaged at the beginning that we would need to have at least in the first years of implementation, two periods to look at how it is implemented. Is it delivering what we wanted? Are there unintended consequences in the different areas? And so that's what we're doing. And I think that's sound from a a regulatory perspective and as a model that I think definitely we can export to the to the exterior. Just to say a few words on Solvency 2 because you know, uh, you, you know I, can, I can talk 10 hours about that, but just to, to say a, a few things on uh, some, some things that I've heard this, uh, this afternoon also. And the, where we are of course also in the process from an AOPA side. You know, we had of course a long list of items and elements that we were requested not only by the Commission, but actually we were requested by the legislation, by Solvency 2, to look upon. And it's really, really long. That's why you have now this consultation of close to 900 pages to digest. Good luck. Thank you. We needed, we needed to do this, of course, and we are at a stage where we are completely transparent. We're coming with a lot of uh, technical analysis, options, uh, questions still open. And that's an important part of this process. There are some areas in there where we are continuing to work. Now, of course, we will come to a point in time and we will have start that process already at AOPA. We are going to look from an overall perspective what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of lesson we take from also the implementation and what kind of lesson we take from the possible unintended consequences that are there and where are the areas that we, uh, we need to touch uh, more. Personally, from my side, and I will be very clear with this, I think there is one area that needs to be adjusted in Solvency 2 because it's, it is now wrong. It's the treatment of interest rate risk. And let's not be naive. What we're doing right now, it is blatantly wrong because it doesn't consider negative interest rates. We have a good part of the portfolio of insurers on the corporate and on the sovereign bonds already with negative, with negative yields. We need to clean that. Mm. And that will, of course, uh, uh, be painful in some circumstances. We have proposed already in 2018 to the Commission to, to do that. They didn't <coughs> want it. It needs to be done. And of course, there will be transitions, all of that. Beyond that, my intention, and I believe that that will be also the intention at my board, is to present proposals that will be, on average, having an effect that things will be balanced. So if we want to have areas where we will need to reinforce capital, we will need to have other areas where we will need also to take attention to uh, release some, some capital to make a balance. That's the overall objective that we have. We will have an overall impact assessment first quarter, at the end of the first quarter next year. And it will cover, of course, a number of these issues related to low interest rates, uh, to the adjustments that we have to the market valuations, but also to issues related to uh, uh, assets and the calibrations of, uh, of the asset side. And let me just say a few words about, about that, because, you know, uh, along these years and many years that I've been in here, you know, I always listen and during the year, of course, this message politically also here very clear and uh, the Minister Bruno Le Maire made it again of the investment in equities and, uh, and, and, and it, I think it's totally legitimate. And let me say it from my side, I, I believe actually that probably there, need, there is space for the insurance sector in Europe, not only in France, to invest more in equities. So there's nothing from our side against investment in equities, on the contrary. <coughs> what we need to make sure, and that's the challenge that I think we, we need to solve collectively, is that this needs to come with the proper type of liabilities to be generated. Because if 
we want to cover liquid promises at any point in time with a lot of investment in equities, let's not fool ourselves, we will need to have capital to back this. If you have more illiquid type of liabilities, more predictable, better matched, then I think we can consider the type of risk that you have in that situation, which is different, and that's why we started already more than one year ago at EOPA to work on this element of illiquidity, to try to reflect that in the way uh, solvency to discount rate uh, uh, is considered. And what we intend to do, and we started already to do it at EOPA, is to also look at the illiquidity element and we'll look at also at the matching element for the calibration of equity risk. So let me be very clear, I'm not against having more equities in the portfolios, but let's be honest, all of us, regulators, industry and consumers, if it is too good to be true, it is too good to be true. So we cannot promise and have guarantees to clients at all time, and then to say that we're gonna do very much long-term investment based on equities, and put the solvency and the calibrations, put it down. Sorry, that is pretending that there's no risk. And the risk doesn't disappear because you take a political decision to have a lower risk charge. The risk continues to be there. I think what we need to do, and I believe it is possible, is to adapt the type of products that <coughs> we collectively offer in order to make sure that we have liabilities that can support this type of more risky investments. And believe me, even in terms of long-term retirement savings, my personal opinion is that that is possible. That is the over, the underarching idea over the PEP that we developed. That's why I fight it a lot to have in the PEP, and I'm very happy that we've made it that through the Parliament that the guarantees in the PEP are not during the product, are terminal guarantees, and that will allow us to develop a framework and a regime that will be conducive to have more risky investment during a number of years that will hopefully, and with a low probability of default, deliver better returns to customers. So my message is very clear. Let's do it together, but let's do it in a way that is a sound way. I don't believe that it is possible to say that basically you put a lower risk charge for all the equities that are there to uh, back all types of liabilities because that is just fudging the risk. Two points more. It's not all about regulation. And I've said this already, I think, in the previous years in here. We're very good in Europe doing regulation. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not so good on doing supervision and enforcement. We need to put more emphasis in that. At EOPA, we are doing our share. I totally agree with what Minister Bruno Le Maire said about the cross-border business. It's something that it's needed. It's our internal market. It's our strength as Europe. We have very good situations of cross-border business throughout Europe that really deliver good results to consumers, good products, more choice, more competition. That's what we should foster. But competition should be made when it makes sense, which is make competition to the services that you provide, to the pricing, the risk management that you do. Competition should not be there by basically lowering the provisions that you should put in place for the products that you run. Competition should not be there by having lower uh, treatment of customers. And unfortunately, we have seen a number of situations of that in the latest years. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, construction business in France was definitely one of these businesses. We, we dealt already, I think, in a good way with this. I think the only way to do this is to have higher standards of supervision to be enforced at the European level and to give European institutions, and in its case is they could be others, I don't care about that, 
but to give European institutions the power to act when poor outcomes of supervision are there also. We cannot stand to have an internal market without having consistent supervision throughout Europe because that's what makes trust be um, you know, defeated into the system. So to answer the, the, the question, yes, I believe that we can export to the world but uh, uh, we need to do better collectively on supervising the rules that uh, we most probably um, design. Merci beaucoup, Gabriel. On, on reviendra sur... Thank you, Gabriel. We'll come back to these matters, but we have a lot of collective efforts to take into account all the constraints referred to today in the Solvency to review and the brand new context of negative interest rates imposes the need for review. I will now turn to Jacques de Peretti. AXA is a global player subject to different regulations in the different countries where they operate. Jacques, could you tell us what are the main challenges facing a global group such as AXA today? Thank you, Jean-Francois. Let me remind you that we are in a difficult environment today. From an economic standpoint, we spoke a lot about low interest rate, but look at the global economy, and the Asian economy in particular. Growth isn't as before, so it's becoming a bit more complicated. From a geopolitical standpoint, the uncertainties are everywhere. From Ireland or from the UK, how can we continue to work? What will happen? What should we say or do? What do you say to our large international clients? It's very complicated. In terms of uh, demographics, we can see that it's an aging population, of course, with wonderful opportunities, but also risks, major risks. So we know all of this. We, I believe, in insurance, we must transform ourselves and come back to the fundamentals. We have a few that are important for us at AXA. First of all, coming back to what our business is all about, covering risks and providing solutions to our clients, as the minister said. We must have a win-win relationship with clients. Clients will no longer place trust in us if we regularly impose things that they do not accept or do not want. So that relates to everything around innovation, operational excellence. Our Business. We're not uh, a simple business. Above all, we must do our business better. And this leads me to highlight another topic. Today, our customers are not ready to pay for our complexity. They're ready to pay for guarantees. So today, the accumulation of complexity that we're seeing today is not conducive, not favorable for our social role and what we should be in this society. And therefore, we must all uh, clean things up before our doors. The regulators, of course, but we do. We have organizations that are too complex today. We have stacked up over time all the things that came in from left and right. But have we thought about having leaner organizations, simpler structures. Is this something we care about enough? I don't think so. Another thing, the way we are doing our business, of course, uh, I would say that today we are the people who pay. Would that be sufficient to withstand other players like GAFAs and the like, who will bring in something new, something simpler, something more fluid, and they would better cover? No. From now on, we must be customers' partners, going beyond just paying for claims and providing solutions. That means, well, be it in medicine, in health care, or in corporate risks or prevention, all of these issues, I think we have neglected them today by focusing on topics that are fundamental, of course, but do not correspond to what clients expect of us. And lastly, but very important, and we have taken some steps on this, as you know, in a risk with financial risk, as we said today, which is becoming 
so impactful, how do we take some distance with financial risk? What we are good at tangling are technical risks. We know how to mutualize and pool. That's what we're strong at. We have taken decisions. We sold a subsidiary in the U.S. that was wholly in life insurance with strong guarantees. We bought a, a company called Excel, mainly on technical risk. So these are, are p deals that uh, we must carry out. How can we set ourselves free as far as possible? Of course, with the right business mix. So in all of this, the regulator cannot live in a bubble without looking at what they're there for. They're there to preserve our activities and to see to it that these activities correspond to a social good. When you're AXA, do you aspire towards more homogeneity and coordination between international regulations, in particular to be able to cope with your competitors? When you are AXA, you aspire, like all insurers, towards having more coordination. That's a fact. But Gabriel said that he wasn't naive. We're not naive either. And what I believe is that even though we can all have our dreams, dreams of an international standard that would be identical for everyone, and I understand that a regulator may dream of it more than a company, but then again, companies, if that were to happen, it would simplify access life a lot. Now, when you look at things front up. I believe that the environment today is not conducive to that. When you look today at how nations are folding back onto, onto themselves, multilateralism collapsing, the rise of nationalism, with your eyes open and, we'd be, and without being naive, can you truly believe in international regulations? This is why, I'll take a concrete example, ICS. That's certainly wonderful. The idea of having identical capital requirements, that is certainly something to make our lives easier, but it's unrealistic. So stop burning kerosene on these topics and let's move on to real issues where there can be convergence with everything linked to common principles and the sort, and not towards a false equivalence that doesn't stand a chance of coming about. That's what it means not being naive. So if solvency too is a model for the world, we wouldn't need ICS, right? Oh, okay. This is the 11th International Conference of the FFA, and we spoke about solvency two a lot in all 11 conferences. So let's change the topic and move on to another European regulation that is important. I'm referring to GDPR. Data is the raw material for insurers, in fact. We have been handling data since the birth of uh, insurance, big data with new opportunities and possibilities uh, for insurers who need new means of protecting data. Marie-Laure Denny, the chairperson of CNIL, could you tell us more about the regulations on data protection and what that has changed for the European industry. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'll reassure you on one thing. I won't talk about solvency too. All the better. And uh, regarding the European regulations that has come into effect since over one year now, since May 2018, it has changed well, the vision of European citizens, let's say in France and elsewhere, because in France we had a previous law set back to 1878. We are the oldest authority for data privacy, so some laws protected, like right of access to data, the right to object, the right to, f to oblivion, certain topics like these already existed. The difference for citizens is that they become more aware of it. And this is a real difference, for example, 
for May 2018 with, implement, with the, the coming into effect of GDPR until 2019, we have had all, just over 12,000 complaints per year. I can multiply the figures, 8 million connections per year on our site, 60% more than before, and I could give you many other such figures. The European regulations, also together with certain scandals when it comes to data protection, the Cambridge Anal Analytica with almost 90 million data on Americans were probably used for political marketing, be it to weigh on the presidential elections in the U.S. on Brexit. All put together, you sell confidence, trust, and there's a growing awareness that you cannot necessarily place your trust in the way data is collected, stored. So I think that's a real issue for citizens and also an issue for companies. With a real shift in the paradigm for GDPR, before it was very administrative and technocratic with authorizations for data processing, the real change is making a company's accountable, famous concept of accountability. It's up to them to comply with the regulations. And the real difference is they must do so continuously in the world of fast pacing technologi technological change. So that's the real difference. If I have one message for you, since you're kind enough to give me this forum with respect to your companies, Data protection should be handled at the highest level of governance in companies because it's not a small risk, because it's not only about managing access rights and rights to object. There are also topics that the authorities have been looking at, the risks linked to cybersecurity as well, for example notice of the infringement of data use, you must notify that to the data protection authorities like NIL uh, within 72 hours. It's up to us to determine whether or not you need to communicate that to your clients. So this is a complex matter because we need to bring in IT experts, legal experts, marketing teams, and if it doesn't come from the executive board, or the board of directors, whereas there is a risk, but not only risk, I like to stress, because after all, this is the theme of your panel discussion on the competitive advantage of implementing treatments that are uh, GDPR proof, so to speak. I think this will be more and more a benefit for your clients and for consumers. Lastly, for the data protection authorities, very briefly, focusing just on one point, sanctions were reinforced. We can now put sanctions up to 4% of the global revenue for company. Of course, that's like a nuclear weapon. And for some of them, so far at the CNIL, we have had the highest sanction, 50 million euros against Google, on a, in a specific area. For Google, that's not much, even though it is a part of a name and shame mechanism that all companies try to avoid. But I note that even for gaffers, it's quite amusing. Each time there's a new product that <coughs> comes up, it's called privacy something, privacy box or whatever. And also we have regulations that are now integrated at European level, and that is a real difference. In other words, to prepare guidelines within the European community of data protection, bringing together all European canals in Brussels to give guidelines on topics of interest to you, different levels of accountability between those in charge of processing, subcontractors, because with GDPR, subcontractors are also accountable when it comes to data protection and also to handle complaints when justified, of course, in cross-border European uh, action so that we can have a one 
place to go when it comes to complaints for data protection. That was a quick answer. Clear today, how does it see to it that GDPR is rolled out properly in Europe? We have a certain number of tools, and this may relate to you. The, we have delegates for data protection which, who must be identified in some companies. Since May 2018, 20,000 delegates were uh, designated in 60,000 companies. There are about 1,000 delegates for data protection in insurance, and we provide them with an online lesson on the CNIL for them. So it is useful. We also provide you with uh, templates for treatment, freely accessible software for you to analyze the impact of risk with respect to data treatment. And in our supporting role, because we're viewed as the police authorities in part, but we focus a lot on helping companies with our means by calling on the heads of the networks, as you are, and with the French Insurance Federation, we have a long-standing partnership dating back to 2012, where we meet every three months in a compliance club, so to speak, uh, a business agenda since 2014 that led to a compliance pact with practical guidelines and advice on how to manage data treatment. Now, with you, it's now being reviewed. We're reviewing the pact to put it to update it um, in view of GDPR. So this type of support that is more specialized and that we try to offer. Thank you so much. Relance du numérique Zurich as AXA is an international group highly concerned in issues related to a level playing field. What should regulations and supervisors and supervisions guarantee so that uh, insurers play their role fully to support the economy and promote growth and innovation. Uh, we have spoken at length about the level playing field today. Do you think that today European insurance groups are not at an advantage compared, for example, to uh, their U.S. counterparts or other players around the globe or maybe the GAFAs? Good afternoon. Investing in companies, Jean-Francois, in order to support growth and the economy is a call coming from the government to all of us. Bruno Le Maire mentioned it again at noon. This is a typically French issue, but it's also beyond that uh, a European uh, challenge and issue. Beyond the uh, trade war, there's the U.S. on the one hand and China and Asia on the other hand. It's between two um, different regions. So what about Europe in between when we know that in the third quarter of 2019, the investment capital and venture capital raised more than $100 billion in the U.S., 40 in Asia, and only $14 billion in Europe? With this in view, well, the question is, what is our role as insurer? This is the heart of your question, Jean-Francois. Uh, I think that we have uh, a triple mandate as insurer. First of all, to invest in the real economy, and this begs the following question. To what extent can we free up capital from our balance sheets, and to what extent regulations and the regulators uh, could help us towards that. The second mandate is about protecting entrepreneurship and consumption. On the eve of this fourth uh, industrial revolution, we're moving from the tangible to the uh, intangible to uh, the intangible to the from the tangible to the intangible, rather, from uh, uh, towards the digital. And today we talk about mobility and there are new risks that are emerging, cyber risks, for example. And these new risks, what they have in common is to become far more complex and systemic. And lastly, 
A third mandate is about supporting the digital and demographic transition of our societies, and there lies an opportunity to create a virtuous circle, i.e. develop savings instruments that support support uh, investments and growth and make sure our citizens benefit from it. This challenge is also to address this transfer of responsibility in terms of social protection uh, when it comes to pensions from the public sphere to the private sphere and even from companies towards individuals, the independent workers, Uberized, uh, self-employed, those uh, that we call today the slashers, that triple mandate which is about investing, protecting, uh, supporting, in order to fulfill it, I wish that we have five regulatory um, priorities, which hopefully will become a model for the rest of the world. The first request concerns regulations that would be less conservative. We've talked about solvency, too, if we reduce the cost of capital uh, by three points, from 6% down to 3%, Zurich in Europe could free up nearly 800 million additional euros to invest in the real economy. And, and it's even 80 billion for the European insurers with the same state of mind. With this, this, along the same lines, Let's trust more self-regulation. We need to strike the right balance between consumer production on the other hand, on the one hand, and our ability to innovate. As an example, our commitment at Zurich in terms of data, we go far beyond uh, compliance. Uh, two requests are related to the competitiveness of our industry. I think we need to strengthen the harmonization within the European Union. We, are, we should avoid that regulatory arbitrage so that within the European Union we can also have a common front in relation to international competitors. Which leads me to my fourth point. Ensure that rules on the global chessboard are more transparent and fair. Jacques was talking about the ICS. We are favorable in principle to the ICS, but we fear that under the constraint of U.S. companies, AIS, be ready to make uh, compromises or uh, trade-offs beyond the reasonable. This was the case. Our position would be to prefer a status quo position to a position where solvency too the Swiss standard be considered as being equivalent to the U.S. standard. It's obvious that we have different degrees of demand. We cannot be uh, considered um, being capitalized to the same extent. Now, my fifth point, as you said, Jean-Francois, it is a, a most significant risk, the arrival of new uh, comers who are not uh, under the same uh, regulations, the cloud, we externalize our data to suppliers who don't have the same obligations or commitments in terms of security, although the responsibility is on our shoulders. The digital platforms are knocking on our doors. We see Amazon with the Amazon Protect, they propose directly online, uh, very short-term insurance uh, products to insure your hard disk or anything else, or Alphabet, Google's parent company is investing 375 million uh, in Oscar L to develop their own insurance uh, products as it relates to health. These four digital um, um, forms have uh, privileged access to customer data, unlike what we have, to, not to the same extent. So I'm um, calling that we continue to work together, move forward together, because what is at stake, the future, is the future of our business, but also the future of our societies and of our economies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florence. Just to stick on this, to this level playing field, Marie-Laure, what is your view about 
European regulation in a global context? Is it a trump card, an obstacle to competition, and perhaps as part of a data landscape which is highly diversified in the world? First of all, regulations go beyond a territory. You know, uh, in the case of companies that aim at the data of Europeans, even for companies that do not have an establishment in Europe, they are uh, subject to the GRDP. So we are asserting, therefore, uh, a certain sovereignty, uh, a European digital sovereignty, which is very strong. And it's not only conceptual. We can see uh, traces of this. I haven't been at the CNIL for a long time. I discovered a whole international privacy world where we see that the impact of the RGPD is not the model. Uh, I don't like to use uh, the word model, which might be seen as some French arrogance but is a source of inspiration for a number of countries, not because of any philanthropy, but only to address uh, the European market. And it, also because it's their, in their interest not only to take into account the uh, uh, increased the population uh, who are concerned with the data protection and have a competitive edge, which is different. And very uh, tangibly, we see that when the uh, free trade agreements between the European Union and perhaps uh, Japan, quite often in the basket, there's also an agreement when it comes to data protection. From what I witness, there are many countries in every continent who are changing their regulations on data now, such as Brazil. India is thinking about it. Uh, they uh, think about it very actively, I mean, uh, many African countries as well. In the United States, it's a major uh, topic. So uh, this extraterritoriality, and if, if the Europeans had a common response to this with a very high standard, so that we are really a benchmark, even if it's not a model. Now, in relation to the U.S., we have different visions. Data protection, as seen from France, or for a European, is like a fundamental right uh, attached to the individual. And there's a far, an another angle related to consumers in the U.S. There's no CNIL as such, but it's part of the Federal Trade Commission to deal with this. And when I am abroad with U.S. representatives, I have someone in front of me who uh, comes from the, uh, the commercial trade department. So approaches can be quite different and not always compatible. This is what I would say very quickly. There's another topic that I didn't mention, but regarding competition, which is really uh, related to data protection, that's the portability of uh, data, uh, new, the new right which is given to every European citizen, which is to be able to r recover uh, the data they gave to a, pro a service provider to keep those data or allocate them to another service provider. So in this right, which objectively is not uh, used as much as it could, it will come, uh, you know, in every uh, European protection uh, body is working towards this. There's a competitive lever, which is quite significant, in order to diminish the captive effect that we might have in relation to large, very large networks, and in order to increase the innovation capacities as well. Thank you very much, Marie-Laure. Now, Gabrielle. What are, according to you, in a global context, the strengths and weaknesses of the European Union and its regulation? Are there any approaches of other countries, whether the United States or others, that could be interesting to look at? Maybe the, the, starting with the weaknesses, uh, because I think we'll leave that during some times uh, in the different areas of the financial sector. I think the biggest weakness of Europe in the international discussions is when we go 
to the international discussions without a common European position. And when we go to international discussions, basically having a fight between Europeans, that really doesn't work well. I think that uh, there were some examples in the past that uh, a number of you in the room uh, know. I think that we have been getting much better uh, in that area. And it helps, of course, to have this process of building European uh, harmonized regimes that, of course, we feel much more comfortable to defend one unique strong position internationally. And the results, I think, are, are, are much, much better at the end of the day. And that's why I believe that uh, you know, this role to build a, international standards in insurance, and it will take time, that's for sure. You know, Basel took 20 years, so we, we still have time to, to get there. But this is the road, and, uh, and I'm profoundly uh, uh, you know, sure that we get there, we will get there. Now, this is, I think, the biggest weakness. The biggest advantage, I think we, to be very honest, I think the biggest advantage is that um, we need, and we should look, and I think we look at that, at our European values, at the core values, why, you know, the societal values, the values, and picking the, the, the example, and I'm not going to talk about GDPR for sure, because I don't know, uh, likewise. But for example, for me, um, we should embrace innovation, for sure. You know, it's there, it's going to come, we need to be competitive, we need to bring innovation to the benefit of the citizens to the customers to provide better services, better products. We should do that. But we shouldn't do that by copying examples from the rest of the world. And I've heard a little bit uh, uh, today in here some messages, of course, of what is happening in Asia, what is happening in the US. I think we should embrace innovation, but being proud of our European values. Because at the end of the day, I'm pretty sure that with the evolution throughout the world, if we stick to our values of privacy, our values of fairness, our values of non-discrimination, this will be the standard for the world. Because that's where all of us globally as citizens want to be. And I believe that this is a balance, of course, but it should be possible and it, it needs to be possible to do that. You know, Just giving an example of what we're doing now at EOPA. With, uh, uh, with the issues related to uh, data, uh, big data usage, for example. We, we put in place uh, uh, an expert uh, panel coming with people from industry, but also academia and consumers to work on what we call principles of digital responsibility in insurance. So we're not reinventing the wheel on the big principles that are there already from GDPR, etc. But how do we apply this to the insurance sector? What does it mean in terms of uh, having an implementation in practice of these regimes that will bring, bring trust in innovation for consumers? And this, I think, it's the road that we need to follow. And if we do this, I'm pretty sure that we will end being a possible model for the world. So let's not Re deny our European values. That's what brings us closer to our citizens, and that's what differentiates us. And I believe that if we continue to do that, we will be winners at the end also in this battle for innovation, in this battle for climate change, uh, transformation in the economy, because we will link it to the citizens at the end of the day. Merci beaucoup. Bah, écoutez, nous arrivons à, à la fin de cette table ronde. Moi, je... Now, this brings us to the end of this uh, panel session, and I would like to uh, really call uh, for um, all to engage in these directions uh, so that we remain uh, key influencers. Uh, I would like to thank all the panelists. Uh,